Okay, right. So, um, welcome to part two of the, of the lectures. Um, this time we're going to focus on the on the QCD axiom, and in particular, pay attention to the to the post-inflation scenario where the symmetry, the spontaneous symmetry, is broken after inflation. Um, for for the QCD axiom, um, I recommend reading uh, these two reviews that came out in came out in Science Advances. They're really aimed at like a general a general scientist rather than anyone with any particular expertise. Um, this one more theory, and this one a review of experiments. Okay, so the the QCD axiom, the idea for it starts with this thing called the strong CP problem, and the strong CP problem starts with thinking about um, giving an electric dipole moment to the neutron. If the neutron were to have an electric dipole moment. This would violate CP symmetry of uh, quantum chromodynamics. So the wigner eckhart theorem in, qu in quantum mechanics tells us that you know, th there's only one vector in the, um, in the rest frame of, of, of a neutron. And so the magnetic dipole moment, um, which we know a neutron has, um, must be parallel to its electric dipole moment. So now, um, what does that mean? If it means so we apply a, a magnetic field and an electric field, and the two dipoles have to line up, the magnetic dipole and the electric dipole. Um, and then under, uh, under transformations like T and P, um, we see that the you know, electric field and the magnetic field um, can, get, can get swapped under those transformations, um, but the, and the dipole changes um, differently under those two transformations. CPT has to be a symmetry, so overall this violates CP. You have to think about this um, a little bit in your own time. So this, so a neutron electric dipole moment like this can arise from something called the theta term in QCD. So this is this is the culprit the, the, in the Lagrangian of QCD. And um, this term is so theta over 32 pi squared times the trace of GG dual. And um, so G is the gluon field strength tensor, which is which is this. A is its, is its group index. Um, it looks like the Faraday tensor, but then it has this extra part because it's a non abelian engaged theory where F are the structure constants of SU3. And G, and G dual is the, has its indices raised using the epsilon tensor. So, that, so this thing A is the SU3 index. It runs over the eight gluons, the eight generators um, of SU3. Um, and these are the structure constants of the Lie algebra and the trace is taken over these indices here. And yet a G, G dual, I mean G dual is G with its indices raised using epsilon and a factor of the inverse metric. And um, the fact, sorry, the <laughs> metric determinant Factor of the metric determinant here cancels out the factor of the metric determinant that we had from the measure in the action and means that overall such a term doesn't depend on the metric at all when it appears in the action. And that tells you that it has to be something that depends only on the topology of the space time. Um, so, it, so that's why it's a top, we call it a topological term. So how does, how does that term give rise to CP violation um, where C is charge conjugation and P is parity? Um, it's a bit it's a bit messy to think of in QCD. So let's just think of the analogy, the analogous term in electromagnetism. So the analogous term in electromagnetism is F F dual, where F is the Faraday tensor. And if you work out what this is um, from the elements of the Faraday tensor, it's E dot B, the e, e electromagnetic field and B, E electric field and B magnetic field. Um, so now I've I've defined parity differently on this slide than on the previous slide. Um, it's whether it's an uh, active or passive transformation. E is a proper vector. E is odd under parity. And B um, is caused by a current of charges. So if you reverse the direction of the charges in the loop, B, B flips. So B is odd under T. So this term, it's odd under P and it's odd under T. Um, it violates P and it, and it violates T. Therefore, it has to violate um, the combination uh, CP in order for the whole theory to violate CPT. These are discrete symmetries. They act on your, they act on your, on your operator, and they just, they return either plus or minus one times the operator. Um, so, if such a term exists in, in QCD that violates CP, you know, sort of standard rules of, of quantum mechanics, it will generate all other terms that violate that symmetry. And one to, one term that violates that symmetry is the electric dipole moment of the neutron. Um, now, people have tried to measure the electric dipole moment of the neutron and have done for decades. Um, these are two people who I've worked with um, who have tried to measure the electric dipole moment of the neutron. Uh, this is Mikhail Rolick and Nick Ayres, and they're standing in front of the NEDM experiment um, in, at the Paul Scherer Institute in Switzerland. And this is a bottle 
um, in which cold ultra cold neutrons can be stored and then they're subjected to electric and magnetic fields by this machine here and then pumped out and from that you can you can measure whether the neutron has an electric dipole moment and it doesn't the electric dipole moment of the neutron is is zero within experimental um, sensitivity so this is the the limit on the neutron electric dipole moment 1.3 times 10 to minus 26 e centimeters it's an electric dipole moment e the electric charge and centimeters the distance of the dipole um so qcd topological term it, it, it turns out you can compute how, how much of a neutron electric dipole moment this, this induces and it induces an electric dipole moment of 3.6 times 10 to minus 16 theta e centimeters now if this is a confusing number um you can sort of imagine a, a classical model for what the electric dipole moment of the neutron might be um i don't have a slide on this but we can just draw it so the neutron is made up of quarks um and it's made up of an up quark and two down quarks and so if we imagine just arranging the arranging the quarks in the neutron like this then we can then we can work out what the classical electric dipole moment is so you know the total charge like the charges of these things are of order e and you know the distance of their separation is of order of fermi so the dipole moment you would expect for just some random arrangement of quarks in, in the in the neutron would be dn of order you know an e fermi basically unless you have some particular arrangement of them that precisely cancels the um you know the, the charge so that there is no dipole moment a random arrangement would give you that e, you know an e fermi is sort of of, of order you know of order 10 to the minus 16 e centimeters so you know it's, it, it makes it makes sense given the scales in the problem now this theta thing here actually has two different contributions in the standard model it has a contribution from the theta term of qcd theta qcd but it also has another contribution from the electroweak sector related to the fact that there is cp violation in the electroweak sector the um the phase of the quark mass of the quark mass matrix so what the what these two measurements tell us is that theta has to be of order 10 to the minus 10 it's a dimensionless number in our Lagrangian um and having something be so small um doesn't really seem to make any sense also given that we know that cp is not a symmetry of nature cp isn't a symmetry of nature k under k is violate cp so why should qcd be preserve, be preserving cp given that the quarks are charged under and the elect under the electroweak theory which violates cp um, so here's a sort of cartoon um couple of slides on on fine tuning in theoretical physics um and, and why we don't like it so what 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 are we interested in in theoretical physics lagrangians and you know what are lagrangians they're operators multiplied by numbers the number is the value of the effect that you measure in your experiment and the operator is the thing that tells you what physical effect you should be looking for and the, the number will be given can be given by you know many different parts of physics some sum over all the different things that contribute to that operator that's contributions to the thing by different sources in our case the strong and weak nuclear forces so the, so if the neutron edm is measured consistent with zero it implies you know some delicate cancellation between unrelated parts of the standard model qcd and the electric theory and theorists don't like coincidences um, well, how does the axion go out, go and clean up this mess? So here's the cartoon, and then we'll move on to the details shortly. Um, so we have a spontaneous spontaneous symmetry breaking, which we met last time already. The spontaneous symmetry breaking has um, a Goldstone boson with a continuous shift symmetry. Theta goes to theta plus alpha that we met yesterday. Um, the trick then is to couple this a Goldstone boson to the problematic operator. And this actually works for the for the strong CP problem because that theta term in the in the Lagrangian is actually an angular variable. So we can you know couple it to a Goldstone boson, which is itself an angular variable. It has the right um, the right topology. Um, so if we couple a Goldstone boson to the problematic operator, then the number goes to number plus theta, but we can just change theta by any constant, and it doesn't matter. So we can just absorb this number into our definition of theta. Very good. Now we've just got a Goldstone boson and not a problematic, um, and not a problematic number. And now we tilt the wine bottle, as we saw already yesterday. That's what that's these, this thing called instantons. And then the field 
rolls around and ends up in it, ends up in its vacuum, vacuum realignment that we met yesterday, and that sends theta to some preferred value. And um, the fact that in QCD this preferred value is actually zero um, is due to um, a theorem called the Baffer Witten theorem. So how does this happen in detail? Enter the axiom. So how do we make theta dynamical with the potential um, possessing a CP symmetric minimum? Is the particle physics ingredients that you need? We introduce our U1 symmetric theory, the Petro Quinn field, um, with its Goldstone boson. Next. And now this is the sort of like particle physics magic that you have to do. We have to chirally charge the quarks um, under the under U1. That means we have to have some fermions that interact with SU3 that are charged under this U1 symmetry, but that the left-handed quarks and the right-handed quarks have opposite charge. If you do that, then the coupling between the Goldstone boson and the quarks has a Dirac gamma five. The gamma five picks out a different charge for the left-handed and right-handed quarks. The quarks are charged under, under um, SU3. So we can draw a loop like this and stick the, stick the gluons on the outside. This diagram leads to what's called an anomaly, which is that the theta term, um, the, the Goldstone boson couples to the gluons, um, and this term violates the, the, the U1 symmetry. It violates the conservation of the scalar of the um, Goldstone boson current. So, so now, and, and this, this diagram generates this coupling, um, theta GG dual, um, and that allows us to absorb whatever original theta there was, whatever problematic number there was with our Goldstone boson. So the way you achieve that, that coupling is by the, this introducing these chirally charged quarks. And then the instantons of QCD come along and introduce a vacuum energy that depends on the value of this theta. Um, now, now that vacuum energy, depending on the value of theta, is there regardless of whether the axion exists. But if theta is a constant, then it doesn't matter. The vacuum energy depends on the theta angle, but the theta angle can't change. But once that thing is itself a pseudo Goldstone boson, now, it's, um, there's a dynamical way to send theta to zero and minimize the energy. So, so the, the, the energy depends on the value of theta, and if theta is dynamical, it can go, um, it can minimize the energy, and that gives rise to an effective potential. So there's, there's the picture again of the instantons tilting the wine bottle. So the axion theta cleans up the strong CP problem uh, um, using an axial symmetry, and that's where it gets its name. Um, it's named after this laundry detergent in America called Axion. Um, it's, a, it's, an, it's, an axi it's related to an axial symmetry. It's a boson, and it cleans up a problem. So it's a, a CP cleaner. Next, why, why, are we, why is everyone so interested um, in Axions? They provide a dark matter candidate. Um, it wasn't designed to, to, to provide a dark matter candidate. It was just designed to solve the strong CP problem, much like supersymmetry was designed to solve the hierarchy problem and has a dark matter candidate, the neutralino. So um, in order to talk about the axion as dark matter, we have to know what, what the particle's mass is. So it turns out that it's related to parameters in QCD like this, m squared, f squared of the axion is related to the lightest um, quark mass, and the U quark times the QCD scale, um, which is roughly the pion mass cubed. And if you plug in you know, values for these things from the, from the particle data group, then you can rearrange and find that the axion mass is this. It's 5 times 10 to the minus 6 electron volts um, times 10 to the 12 GeV over F, where F is at a K constant. Now this thing follows the story that we met last time. You can have relic oscillations in this field if it starts off initially displaced, and these relic oscillations behave like dark matter. And the thing is, some cold, is, it, is a cold condensate of this oscillating field with a very low mass. So locally, how do we think of how do we think of the field? Well, the, the energy omega a if c squared is equal to one um, is the rest energy um, plus a half mv squared. Um, so that's basically the mass um, plus about ten to the minus six if v is in the Milky Way. Um, and we can convert the the, fre the frequency the mass the frequency of the oscillations into uh, you know into frequency units rather than ev. And we find that the frequency of the axion oscillations is around one gigahertz if the mass is about six microEV. 
So it's good to have this conversion between electron volts and, um, and frequency in your head because it helps you think about um, phenomenology. Right, so the local dark matter density is given as a harmonic oscillator. Rho dark matter, the thing that we know is about 0.3.4 GeV per centimeter, per centimeter cubed, is m squared by naught squared, where phi is the average local value of the axion field um, related to the, to the theta angle by the parameter fa. So we know rho dark matter, so that allows us to eliminate the value of phi naught here. Um, and so it's a, it's a one parameter model. Um, it's specified just by the axion mass um, because the axion mass is related to this thing fa. So there's only one parameter in the model, the mass of the particle. Um, no, the, the, the location of the minimum doesn't affect the mass. The fact that the minimum is at zero and solves the strong CP problem is um, this thing called the waffer witten theorem. Um, okay, so what is axion dark matter? It's, it is literally, if you want to think of it this way, um, energy stored in spatial and temporal variations of the theta angle of QCD. If you like spatial and temporal variations of the neutron electric dipole moment, energy stored in the field that describes this, plus potential energy due to the um, instantons of QCD. So it's, so it's quite bizarre when you think of it like that, but it's not, it's, it's not really some collection of you know, massive um, cold particles. It's energy stored in spatial and temporal variations of the, of the QCD theta angle, plus instanton potential energy from QCD. Quite bizarre. But great, it's even better. Um, it's not just the axion CP cleaner, it now comes with added dark matter. Okay, so a little bit more about the, about the QCD axion mass, about these you know, curious things called, called instantons. Um, so the mass of the, the pseudo Dolson boson ar um, arises from the fact that the QCD becomes confining. The QCD isn't a theory of free quarks and gluons, and um, below the QCD temperature, it's a theory of, of pions. Um, of things with mass. Um, and so we, we you can describe um, the theory in this limit using something called chiral perturbation theory. And it tells you that there's a relationship between the mass of the axion and its decay constant and the mass of the pion and its decay constant. It's another way to remember the, the relationship between these scales. The pions are the, are, are, and the axions are together Goldstone a group of Goldstone bosons of this spontaneously broken um, chiral symmetry of QCD, which is broken by confining. Now, QCD is strongly coupled, so perturbation theory um, is, is, is no good, um, but you can try and compute more about the, about the axion mass using you know, other methods in QCD. There's something called the dilute instanton gas, um, and, that, and that allows you to work out what the temperature dependence of the axion mass is. Um, and like in general, the m squared f squared is proportional or equal to what's called the QCD topological susceptibility. And this can be computed using uh, lattice QCD. Um, and these people, Borsani et al, have done that. They've computed the QCD topological susceptibility using lattice QCD over a range of temperatures. And it looks like this. It has this t to the minus eight behavior at large temperature, which is consistent with this thing called the dilute instance on gas where the axion mass goes like t to minus four, it goes up and then it turns over and becomes flat somewhere around the QCD phase transition, 150, 200 um, MeV. And then it's flat and the zero value of this thing from lattice QCD is consistent with the chiral perturbation theory result that it should be equal to m pi squared f pi squared. Um, it's not from perturbative temperature corrections. It's fr from, you know, well, like non-perturbative temperature dependence in QCD. But yeah, that thermal effects in the potential. Um, not right now. Um, it's a, it's a bit, it's a bit of a, it's a bit of a long story, but but we can talk, but we can talk about it off, um, like offline maybe. Uh, the pion mass, the pion decay constant. Yeah, it, it's the thing that tells you how quickly the pion decays the photons. And um, you can look it up in the PDG. Um, it's, it's a rate constant that determines um, the rate at which 
uh, the pi zero um, decays to two photons. So this, this rate is, I think the rate for this process, the square of this is like m pi cubed over f pi squared. And that's what defines f pi as the measurement of that rate, pi, pi onto photon decay. Right. Yeah, so this is all a bit mysterious, QC, um, QCD stuff, using instantons and lattice QCD and all of that. Um, but it's just but the, the takeaway message is we know what the axion mass is in terms of quantities in QCD that can be measured. And we have a prediction for how the mass depends on temperature. That's what matters for the cosmology and the relic abundance. Um, and yeah, the, the temperature dependence of the mass comes along and changes the story of realignment that we talked about yesterday. In, in, two, um, in two ways. They're not, they, they don't change the story too much, um, but you have to bear them in mind. So first of all, we have to find out, when finding out when the oscillations happen, um, we have to bear in mind that the, that the mass is temperature dependent. So we compare the temperature dependence of the mass to the temperature dependence of the Hubble rate, whereas before we just had a constant mass. So we have to use the temperature as a variable, um, which means that rather than using you know, the Hubble expression for Hubble that you're more familiar with in the late universe. Um, you have to use the expression for Hubble in a radiation dominated universe, depending on the temperature. 3, 3 h squared m Planck squared is pi squared over 30 g star t to the four, where g star is, if you don't, if you don't know um, what, g, if you haven't come across g star before, go and read you know, chapter, chapter two or chapter three of Colbin Turner. G star counts um, how the relativistic degrees of freedom contribute to the energy density. And it, and it looks like this as a function of, temp of um, temperature going down to the left. Um, and that means that you can't like analytically find out where T os is. So you have to go and find you know, some, some tabulated version of G star and, and solve this equation uh, numerically to find the temperature which that thing oscillates to the left. Oh no, so, um, so G star here it isn't, isn't, isn't including the axions, this is just, um, relativistic degrees of freedom in the standard model. Um, ah, right, well, it's neutrinos and photons now, but as you increase in temperature, it includes also the muons. And as you go up through the QCD phase transition, it includes the gluons and the Higgs and, and everything in the standard model. So G star changes to the number of relativistic freedom changes from 106.75 high temperature to 3.35 at low temperature. This doesn't include the, the axions. The axions can contribute a small amount to the relativistic degrees of freedom. Um, but here it's assuming that they're subdominant. It's just the standard model. This is just the expression for the, for the energy density of a completely relativistic um, thermal fluid. Right. The other thing that um, is a little bit more complicated computing the relic density, um, to get the relic density last time, we just said, what's the, what's the density when the field starts oscillating? That goes like a, like a to the power minus three, get the density today. When the mass is changing as a function of temperature, it turns out that it's not the energy density that goes like a to the power minus three, but the number density that goes like a to the power minus three. And that means that you have to be a little bit more careful in how you get the density. So the number density when the oscillations begin um, is the energy density divided by mass. So it's roughly m, times um, m over two, I forgot a factor two here, times phi at t os squared. And then the number density goes like one over a cubed. So we just do that. But because it's also in this interesting thermal phase of the universe, you have to also remember that the scale factor is not just proportional to one over temperature, but the factor of this thing called G star S for the entropic degrees of freedom. If you haven't come across this before, just go and read about it. Colbin Turner. And then the final energy density today is the number density times the mass at T zero. So you, end up with, so you end up with the mass at T0 and the mass at the oscillation temperature appearing in the final expression, and they aren't necessarily the same thing. For the QCD axion, typically the oscillation temperature is around one GeV, so it's up here somewhere, and that means that these factors of the changes of G star are really important to get the relic density right. And that means that you have to do everything with tabulated functions and do it numerically, so yeah, there's no like simple closed, the, 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 the expressions are not so simple. Okay, what is the axion mass? So um, for the QCD axion, we know that its mass is less than about 10 to the minus two electron volts. That's from, from um, effects that it would have on this on supernova 1987a. I don't have time to go into them in this lecture. 
I can talk about them at the end. And we know that, okay, well, yesterday we learned that the mass has to be much, much larger than about 10 to the minus 22 EV. So let's just stick that, out, stick that as a rough limit here. Um, anything that's very light. And the QCD axiom, how would we get it light? We have to increase the value of F. Putting F above the Planck scale makes particle physicists uneasy if you have any scales in your theory above the Planck scale. So somewhere, if you want to make the axiom really light, you have to start coming across exotic theories like string theory and coming up with fuzzy dark matter. We saw last time that there's um, limits in the middle of the mass range coming from black hole super radiance that mean you have to be heavier than roughly 10 to minus 11 EV. And that's rough. this is the range for the QCD axiom. It's 10 to the minus 11 EV coming up with black hole super radiance is QCD axiom with the mass with the decay constant a little bit above the Planck scale. So the QCD axion has to live somewhere in this range here, nine orders of magnitude. The scenario A for symmetry breaking that we learned about yesterday, um, symmetry breaking after inflation, it can give you the, the correct relic abundance for the QCD axion across this entire range. That's because of the free parameter. What's the, what's the value of the field um, when the, when the if the symmetry is broken before inflation, which I'm calling scenario A, then the initial value of the field, if you remember, was a free parameter independent of the mass. You've got two free parameters, so you can fit the relic density using one of them, and you have using the initial field value, and you don't know what the mass is. So in scenario A, there is no prediction for what the QCD axiom mass is. But in scenario B that we're going to learn about today, it makes a prediction for the QCD axiom mass. It's, it's still relatively wide, as we'll discover, but scenario B is restricted to the higher end of the mass scale for the QCD axiom. Scenario B, no, um, so, the QCD, so the QCD axiom can live anywhere here, 10 to the minus 11 to 10 to the minus 2 EV. Um, I'll say that anything lighter than 10 to the minus 11 EV is, is exotic, some kind of axiom like particle. Um, and then for the QCD axiom, symmetry breaking before inflation, you can be, have any mass. Symmetry breaking after inflation has to live up here. So for the, QC, so for the QCD axiom, M is fixed uniquely in terms of F always. Um, and, and the only, if, if, if you have an axiom like particle where M and F are not related, then you can then you can live anywhere. But for the QCD axiom where M and F are related, in this in this scenario in this scenario, we'll find out that there's no free parameter. And, and that's what we're going to talk about for the next hour. Um, but before we start on that journey, I just want to like sort of highlight the difference between um, the differences and similarities between um, axioms and WIMPs. They were both theories proposed in the 70s and 80s. Um, you know, WIMPs came out of supersymmetry, axioms came out of the Petri Quinn solution to the CP problem. In like, like the same year, 1983, people computed the relic density of the neutralino and the relic density of the axion. All this stuff is happening at the same time. The first experiments to search for both of them happened in 1987, the year of my birth. So for WIMPs, there was a search called the Homestake Mine experiment. And for axions, there were the first microwave cavity halescopes. These both happened in 1987. But then since then, they've had very different histories. Um, so for, for WIMPs, you know, we have uh, the theory and exclusion plots like this, WIMP mass versus cross section. And this theory prediction range here is the theory prediction for um, some scan of, super, of the MSSM. Right? And, and the exclusion from experiments does, has, has managed to reach the level that it's exclu excluding meaningful parts of the parameter space of the MSSM. And, and the prediction from the MSSM is quite tight. You had this, like the canonical WIMP. The canonical WIMP was like up here, and it was excluded in 1987, actually. Um, but for axions, the story is very, very different. The theory prediction, there's a relationship between mass and F, is equivalent to there's a relationship between mass and coupling, the photons is this red line here. The QCD axion prediction is here. And that prediction has been the same prediction ever since the 1970s and 80s. But the experiments have just not done very well at trying to search for the QCD axion. There are astrophysical limits that place this upper limit on the mass, supernova 1987a that I just mentioned and others. 
But other than that, we don't know anything. So we've got this big red line. And the experiments have only managed to do very narrow constraints. So, it's a, so the theoretical, so the, so the story of what's happened you know, since the 1980s has been very, very different because the experiments to search for axions are, are so difficult. But that is all changing. The, um, so the black lines are what are called the um, KSVZ and DFSZ models, and and the red band is some is some prior on is some varying some prior on the parameters in in, in those models. Uh, the the ratio, if you want to know ex exactly, it's the um, the band varies the ratio of the electromagnetic anomaly to the color anomaly over some range. Okay, so. I said that experiments searching for axions are hard, um, but the but the, the but that's all going to change, and we've got lots of new experiments. But how do these how do these work, and um, and what's the future? So we're going to spend about 10, 20 minutes now talking about the basics of direct detection of axions. So how do we how do we search for axions? The last ingredient is how do axions interact with us? They interact by a by a classical electromagnetism. Yeah. We're going to do the other production later. Um, th the thermal production of axions is, is generally negligible because the coupling is very small. Um, but then the other production mechanism we're going to talk about is from topological defects. Thermal, produ thermal production is, is negligible across most of the parameter space. Um, well, I'll tell you what coupling it is because I didn't write it down. So the axiom was sort of defined right by um, the coupling of the field the GG dual of, of um, GCD. Symmetry allows it to couple to FF dual of electromagnetism. And this means that the axion modifies Maxwell's equations. So you can get Maxwell's equations by having you know, the F squared term in this Lagrangian. So if we do a variation of the action with respect to, um, to the field of electromagnetism, the field phi is going to show up in Maxwell's equations. And so th this is the, the source Maxwell's equations that we're familiar with. DV equals rho F, curl B minus E dot equals JF, where these are the, from the free, free charges, rho and, um, rho and JF and free charges. This is how the axiom modifies Maxwell's equations. It, it can act like a, like a source for the electric field, G, B dot grad phi, and it can act as, a, as, an, as sort of an anomalous current, E phi dot minus, minus e, e cross grad phi. Notice that only derivatives of the axiom field appear here. So it's grad phi and phi dot, a constant axiom field, doesn't do anything to Maxwell's equations. It's got to have either spatial or temporal variation. That's consistent with the idea that this term, if phi is a constant, is a total derivative. So that, that this, that these terms only affect the action via, via their derivatives. So the action field like, acts like an anomalous, anomalous source. Um, and also note here, yeah, that its source is E parallel to B. So here we've got the electric field, but, and then we've got the magnetic field pointing in the same direction. Here we've got the magnetic field, and we've got something with the electric field in the same direction. For normal electromagnetic waves, you always have E and B um, perpendicular to each other. The axion allows you to have field configurations with E and B parallel to each other. And that's because if you write up that FF dual, it's E dot, it's e dot B, um, as we've already come across. And so if we want to search for, for, for the axion, we can try and amplify the effects here by creating some kind of resonance, and the and the and the amplitude of the source phi. So what what's phi, what's the value of phi and what's its time derivative? That's fixed by the local dark matter density. I wrote that down already, and we've got just this free parameter g, the coupling constant, which in QCD turns out to be related to the mass also. Um, so you can think of this also as like a modification to the Hamiltonian that looks like this. 
But if we know um, the axion mass, we know how we know what the what the frequency is that it's oscillating at. We know what kind of resonator to make. We know the strength of the electric and magnetic fields that it might induce. Um, if we don't know the axion mass, then we need to try. Then we need to scan for different frequencies to search for it. And that, that can be done using something called a resonant cavity haloscope. So now let's take um, Maxwell's equations um, and let's assume that B is an external source. Let's assume that phi, the axion dot matter field, is also in the room. It's also an external source. And then we can write down um, a second order wave equation for the electric field. It looks like this. E double dot minus grad squared E is equal to some source, which depends on the magnetic field and the local dark matter density and axions, cosine omega t, the axions oscillating at this frequency omega we saw already. That is um, a driven oscillator equation. We can try and make it resonant by if we confine the electric field. So if we put two mirrors, then the boundary conditions tell us that the um, that the, the grad squared of E has to be N squared pi squared over L squared, where N is some integer. So now we've fixed the, the frequencies that E is allowed to have. And that means, uh, so E has some particular frequency omega. And if we can match this omega of the electric field to the omega of the dark matter, to the frequency of the dark matter, then we'll have, re then we'll have resonant enhancements of the electric field caused by the oscillations of the dark matter field. Just class classical driven oscillator. Right, now, okay, so how much power would that produce? Yeah, so this is, so, so this omega is what I wrote down a few slides ago. Um, uh, where is it? Yeah. Um, omega is m plus a half mv squared. So it's basically m. The frequency is basically m. It's, it's one gigahertz times the mass over um, the constant that I gave before. Right. So if we if we if we knew the frequency of the axion, if we knew its mass, we would just put build a resonant cavity, resonantly enhance the electric field. We'd create a whole bunch of power in the electric field and try and read it out with some antenna. Um, so how do we work out what that is? So the mirrors will in general be be lossy. There'll be some losses in this equation, so it'll be a, a damped driven harmonic oscillator. Um, and also if you stick an antenna in there and try and extract the power of an antenna, that's also some kind of loss. You would couple the antenna to the cavity. And that defines something called the quality factor, which is the energy stored divided by the energy loss per radian. The output power of an oscillator like this is just you know, standard classical, um, classical field theory. The, the average power loss over a cycle is omega over Q times the energy stored. It's omega over Q times the energy stored, which is the value of the electric field on, re um, on resonance, which you just find from the solution of a driven damped oscillator, times the volume. And so it's G squared, B squared, V rho, Q over M. So, you know, so if you know the Q of your resonator, then you, know what um, then you know what power you should be expecting for a given value of G or M. And then we don't know the mass of the axion. So ideally you want to be able to tune this resonator, change the distance between the mirrors, and scan over different frequencies. Put it in one position, one frequency, wait and see if you see a signal, you don't see one, change the distance, wait until you see another signal, work out what your, what your signal to noise is using something called the radiometer equation. Yeah. The local velocity, yeah. Yeah, yeah. right. Um, but but we but it's it's approximately you know to a hundred kilometers per second. So in what's called the standard halo model, you would assume that that v is drawn from a Maxwell Boltzmann distribution with mean of a hundred kilometers per second. Just like in dark matter direct detection, you have to assume some model for the halo. Um, yeah. But the, but because v um, v um, m v squared is a lot smaller than m. The, the spread in frequency induced by the, by, the, by the motion of dark matter is only of order 10 to the minus six. So it's a narrow line that you have to search for. And so people have tried to build such um, 
resonant cavity haloscopes. So this is the sort of picture. You have an axion coming in, it interacts with the magnetic field, it turns into a photon, which is an electric field. You read that out with your antenna. How do you tune the frequency? In practice, you don't have mirrors that you move. In practice, you have a fixed size cavity and you have some rods in it and you change the positions of the rods to change what the resonant frequencies are. The resonant frequencies aren't given by n pi over L. What you have to do is you know, work out what the resonant frequencies of your, of your cylinder is and you use some engineering software to do that. And you have to choose some particular mode called the TM010 mode. Um, so how do you detect an axion? You need a magnet, you need a resonator. The signal turns out to be very small, so you need to put your resonator in a fridge and amplify your signal. But this is the basic principle under which all axion direct detection experiments work. And so these have been built, and the leading such experiment is called ADMX, the Axion Dark Matter Haloscope, um, originally proposed by Sakivi in 1983. And um, these aren't particularly big or expensive experiments overall. This is in the basement um, at, Was at Washington University. These, there are experiments like this sort of built all over the world now. There's one in Taiwan. There's, a, there's about five in Korea in a big specialized lab. Um, there's one being built in France. Um, and because anyone builds a different resonator, covers a different frequency range, just go ahead and do it. So, and it can be done, you know, like, rel like relatively cheap. These are sort of tens of millions of dollars experiments. Um, yeah, so this is the, this is the flagship axion search at the University of Washington. And it looks inside like the cartoon that I drew with these rods that change it. And the, re the reference power that you get out at the, if, you, if you wanted to find the QCD axion, the power that's put into that cavity is about 10 to the minus 22 watts. So it's a very, very tiny signal. So the whole game is having sensitive detectors. Um, and, and ADMX used something called a Josephson parametric amplifier to try and, to try and do this. At different frequency ranges, you need different types of technology. Um, so that's the sort of power scale to think of and keep in mind. This type of technology works for things that are resonant with stuff that's about this big. You can't really make much smaller resonators because you'd lose volume. And you can't really make much bigger resonators because you can't maintain magnetic fields of eight Tesla over very large volumes. So it's a limited technology that only works if the axion has a mass of around the gigahertz. And we'll come back to this right at the very end as to why that's a problem for the post-inflation axion. But experiments and observations. So here's the axion mass. Here's the axion coupling. Um, here, are the, here are the searches um, by ADMX and all these other, all these other haloscopes. Um, this is the parameter space, open strength select magnetism. Okay, astrophysics, cosmology, and experimental limits. Resonant microwave cavities work at um, gigahertz frequencies. Everyone is excited about axions because this parameter space is going to change a lot in the next 10 to 20 years. I said this a few times. All these different experiments, all these different ideas will hopefully cover almost the entire parameter range of the QCD axion from 10 to the minus 11 EV all the way up to 10 to the minus 2 EV. So there's the prospect to change that story that I mentioned, the difference between axions and WIMPs by new technology that's going to be developed and hopefully um, find the axion in the next you know, decade or two. So it's a very exciting time. All the white space above the yellow line, except with, with a couple of notable gaps at the top and the bottom. So. Alps can be anywhere. There could be an Alp here, there could be an Alp here. You can go to band QCD axiom, but it's a target. It's a very well-defined target, and it's not a moving target. The two lines there, the two black lines, which, which everyone measures their experiment by, you get to the first one, and you say, we've, we've ruled out the KSPZ axiom. You get to the second one, we've ruled out the DFSD axiom. Those theories haven't changed since 1983. Nothing has changed about them. They're one-parameter models, and they haven't been touched since the 80s, and they're still well-defined targets. And that's why it's such a beautiful thing. Um, but it's very hard because the signals are 10 to the minus 22 watts and you don't know the frequency range over nine orders of magnitude. Um, so it's very tiny signals, very wide parameter space, but the theories haven't changed since the 1980s. 
you, you have to get um, within 10 to the minus 6 of the resonance frequency. Um, well, okay, well, no, not necessarily. So some of these experiments are, bro um, are broadband, actually. Um, so DM radio is actually relatively broadband, and this experiment, BRASS, is actually relatively broadband. So you can do broadband searches and give up on the resonance enhancement. Um, and and how, actually, how close you get to the frequency is not determined, is determined by the quality factor of your experiment. So that quality factor of the resonance, um, ADMX quality factor is roughly 10 to the 4. So they get within to the frequency within a factor of 10 to the minus four, and then they move to the next frequency. Actually, how close you need to, to get depends on how much you want to amplify your signal. You have some quality factor of your resonance. That tells you how much power you're going to get out, um, and that tells you how close you want to get. Once you get closer than 10 to the minus six, the signals will know your changes a bit. No, the, the constraints here apply everywhere. Um, they're only a function of M and G. So all the constraints here apply for, for any ALP if you just tell me M and G. The blue limits um, are, these depend a little bit on, on the assumptions about your cosmology. Um, the limits um, from the haloscopes de depend on you assuming that you are all of the dark matter. And that the other limits are independent. Yeah. Yep. 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 And um, so across, so in all of this range, in all of the range here, um, it's stable on cosmological timescales. Um, but the limits here that come from um, EBL and X rays actually come from the decay. So at high mass, the decay, um, the decay is relevant. At low mass, it's not. Um, the decay rate is, um, is the same as the pion decay rate, but F is much, much larger and M is much, much smaller. Right, so now... Um, no, the, the red limits um, that come down from ADMX is for 100% dark matter of X. The line is just the prediction of the QCD axiom. I haven't fixed the dark matter density yet. You can get the right dark matter density anywhere on this line in scenario A. Anywhere on this line in scenario A, you can get the right dark matter density. In scenario B, you get the right dark matter density here. Okay. Right. And now we're finally going to talk about scenario B. Um, I'm running a little bit low on time, but we'll we'll, we'll go through the we'll, we'll go through the physics and go through the, through the phenomenology quickly. Right. So scenario B that I've kept on going on about. I should have been here about 20 minutes ago, but never mind. Right, so what happens in this scenario B? In the case where our field um, comes from a spontaneously broken global symmetry, that's QCD axion, there's a scenario where spontaneous symmetry breaking can happen after inflation. So in this case, the value theta picks some value um, on, um, over the horizon size when the symmetry is broken, um, but that horizon size is much smaller than the horizon size today, so our horizon size today encompasses many patches that have different values of theta. This means that the field evolution is messy and nonlinear, and we can't just use the simple ordinary differential equation to get the relic density. The advantage um, of this scenario is that it averages out the random value of theta. So before we could pick any value of theta we want, and in the case of the QCD axiom, get the right relic density anywhere we want. In this case, theta is no longer a, the initial value of theta is no longer a free parameter. We've gone from a two parameter model with mass and initial field value to literally a one parameter model. So then if we were to fix the dark matter density, we would, we would know what the axiom mass is. So it makes the model entirely predictive, but the prediction is very, is very difficult to make because of the messy field evolution. Comment is that this, this scenario is consistent with large value and scalar ratio. So the, this random value of theta um, leads to what are called topological defects. And I'm going to focus on the case of cosmic strings 
domain walls I'm going to forget about. Um, right. So imagine choosing a value for theta every, uh, different, um, everywhere in the universe um, after spontaneous symmetry breaking. The value of theta can only be correlated on regions of order the horizon size. So we're taking now the, the value of theta, which is the, you know, the location of some arrow in the complex plane of the field phi, and I'm mapping it, say, onto the xy plane. So then theta takes some value, say, like this, on a region of order the horizon size. Then in some other region of order the horizon size, it might take a value like this, or like this, or like this. And in general, if you just throw down random values of an angle, there will always be some places where such a field configuration happens, where it winds around. When, it, when in a location where the, where the value of the field winds around, you, can no longer, you can't define the angle anymore in the center. What that means in terms of the complex field and its spontaneous symmetry breaking potential is that at this value, the field has to be at zero, which means at this value, it's stuck on the top in the middle of the wine bottle potential. Um, and then this, uh, this, happen, this has to happen in, in some continuous way because the field itself is continuous. So we have infinite one dimensional um, objects called cosmic strings formed by this process. Those objects are stable as long as the value of theta has no preferred value and it's random. When, when the mass for the field switches on, the field want, um, then the angle all wants to go to zero. They roll around and start oscillating. So all of, the, all of the arrows go to point in one direction. Once they're all in one direction, there's no restriction for this sitting at the origin anymore and the, and the string goes away. So once, the, once theta has a preferred value, once the axial mass causes oscillations, the strings go away. Before that, the strings are stable. And so this looks, like, looks something um, like this. This is now a, a figure from Javi Redondo. So if you imagine the value of theta from minus pi to pi, and he's colored it so minus pi and pi are the same, they're white. So that's because it's a field that's periodic. And this is what a field configuration looks like, taking some slice um, through some random field. So it looks like this. You know, I've got values of um, pi. I've got values of um, you know, pi over two. I've got values of zero. But if you zoom into some, re some regions of this field, you have some places like this, where you go from minus pi to pi all the way around. And then, there's some de and then there has to be some defect in the middle. And then if you take this you know, um, into a 3D box, this little defect here will become a string. Um, so the aesthetic advantage, as I mentioned already, of a scenario A is there's no free parameter, but the disadvantage is that it's a very hard computational problem. It's no, there's, and there's no consensus really on what the relic density is as a function of mass. In order to solve the problem, you have to do lattice field theory. So you have some part, so you have, you have to solve the full Petri Quinn field, this complex field. You have to solve its evolution in an expanding universe. And you've got time derivatives and spatial derivatives and nonlinearities. So it's a nonlinear partial differential equation in expanding space. So you have to use, so you have to, use um, a lattice to solve that. Um, and a solution to that looks like this. So here the color is just to help you differentiate the vertical axis. Um, so here are, the, here are the strings, you can see them. And here the, the computational box is the big box and the size of the horizon is the box here that's expanding. And what you'll notice is that the number of string, even though this network is evolving in some messy way, the number of strings inside the box is almost constant. And that's what's called a scaling symmetry. Um, domain walls, I'm going to skip over. Because in order to get the relic density, you can't just solve an ordinary differential equation like we did before. You have to solve this non this PDE. Yeah, but you can't do it. And I'm about to explain why. Um, so unfortunately, the dynamics has a large hierarchy of scales. So you can't solve the PDE over all the scales that you want to solve them over. Um, and th the reason is the following. So when the strings are formed, they're formed when the petri quinn phase transition happens. It means that the size of the strings is of order the mass of the radial field in the symmetry breaking potential. <laughs> 
um, which is of order the symmetry breaking scale itself, which is very large, 10 to the 10 GeV, let's say. So there, the, so the size of the strings is like this, and you want to resolve the strings with a few lattice points. Then as time goes on, the universe expands. So the blue box, the Hubble, gets bigger, but the size of the string remains constant. And as time goes on, there's this scale separation between the size of the string, which you still want to resolve with a few lattice points, and the size of the universe becomes very, very large. But the strings don't decay until the axion starts oscillating. At MA and the scale separation between the axion mass and the mass of the radial field is around log of the log of that scale separation is 70. Whereas you can only do the simulation for log of scale for the scale separation log of order eight. So you cannot solve the dynamics all the way from where the symmetry breaking happens to when the strings decay. So you can't, so you can't solve it by brute, by brute force. So the problem is in extrapolating the results of the simulation from the end of the simulation, when the scale separation is log of eight to the physical scale separation, log of 70. So you have to extrapolate your simulation results and that's the problem. Does that make sense? Right, so that's why so that's why it's difficult um, and and the difficulty is in trying to push this um this log scale separation but you're never going to push the scale separation all the way to 70. it's all about then how you do the extrapolation which is what we're going to talk about now it is um it is in co-moving volume um but the, the still the 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 box still gets bigger relative to theta. I mean, relative to the size of the string. If you did it in a fixed, if you did it in a fixed physical volume, then that volume would be much smaller than the horizon size, and you wouldn't see the strings. It's about the scale separation. You have to simulate at the horizon size because that's where that there's about one string per box, but the size of the string is smaller than the horizon. You can't get around that problem. Okay, so I'm very quickly running out of time. Um, but I want to tell you about what the relic density is in this scenario and how it leads to a prediction for the axion mass. So axions from strings, um, it sounds very different to misalignment, but it's really just a variation of the misalignment mechanism. The misalignment mechanism was we take a field, it's not in its vacuum, it evolves. And at late times, we want to know how much energy density is in the oscillations. The string network stuff is we take a complex field, we displace it from its vacuum, it evolves, and at the end, we want to find out what's the energy density in the oscillations. It's the same, it's exactly the same physics. It's just now it's a much harder equation to solve. Um, and the strings, when the axion field goes to zero, the whole the whole of the complex field goes to zero, and we just end up in oscillations of the axion field. So we say that the strings decay to axions, but it's just a classical field moving to its vacuum. So it's really just a variation on the same thing. Um, so the string density um, is given by something called um, the number of strings per horizon times the tension and um, divided by T squared. That's how the energy density of a string scales. We saw that the number of strings per horizon is sort of going to some kind of constant, um, but it's, it actually appears to go to you know, some slow time variation called a, a logarithmic scaling violation. Yeah, yeah, you know, you have the spatial variation of the field. Yeah, so, so, now, so now this is like an approximate way to think about what's going on. Think about just like what is the network of strings doing averaged. This is now like an analytic description of the energy density from the string network. The average energy density, yeah, this is the average energy density in the, in the whole network. Um, 
Yeah, I'm just imagining like analytically, what does the energy density of a string network do? Specified by how many strings there are, how the energy density of a string changes when you change the, when you change the volume and the tension. So if I had a collection of particles, the energy density of particles would depend on the mass of the particles. It would go down like A cubed, and, um, and then it would depend on how many particles there are. The energy density of a string network just depends on how many strings there are, what their tension is, and the energy density of a string network goes down like one over T squared. This is just an analytic description of a string network. Yeah. 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 So in, in the numerical solution, you have all, you have all the different things that right? you have the energy in the radial mode, you have the time dependence, you have the space dependence, you have the energy in the Goldstone mode, energy in the potential, all of that's there. But if I assume that I can just describe this as an as a as a network of strings, then this is the approximation for what the energy density is. This is an, an analytic model for a string network. If you like, this is Nambu Go. So So, um, in order to, to understand what happens to a string network, again, to the, to the analytic model, I'm going to connect it to the simulations in a minute. So, the string network has this sort of scaling behavior, a fixed number of strings per, per horizon volume. So the, so, the energy density of the strings, it's rho dot plus 2h rho, that's what gives you the 1 over t squared scaling, has to be balanced in order to stay in this scaling solution, has to be balanced by the emission of the axions minus gamma a. Um, which probably should have a row s here. Yeah, there should, should be a row s um, for the unit. The sc a scaling solution, an almost um, constant um, number of strings per horizon, implies that 2h rho has to be minus gamma rho. So you can work out what that is from my expression for rho. The axion number density um, under this solution um, is given by an integral of the, of the string spectrum. The axion number density is the integral um, dk over k of the string spectrum. Then I'm going to find the instantaneous emission spectrum, the gamma by dk. So this emission, this is the averaged overall k modes, the gamma by dk. I'm just going to define to be equal to some overall rate over h times something called f, which is the instantaneous emission spectrum. You can then, under, under you know, this ANSATS, you can integrate the spectrum to get the number density of axions that are being produced. So the string network is evolving. It wants to stay on this attractor solution that was observed. To stay on that solution, it has to emit axions. So there's, so there's a balance between the string network and the number of axions that it is emitting. And I'm just parameterizing that. The number density of axions is given by the time integral of you know, things. This, the R is the scale factor here. Gamma is the, is the rate of emission of axions by the string network, and then an integral over this emission spectrum F. So, so what I've done here is I've, if I, is I've written everything now in terms of an instantaneous emission spectrum, which I can try and measure in the simulation. So in the simulation, you measure the instantaneous emission spectrum of axions from strings. And then from that, I can work out what the number density of axions is, and I can try and make my extrapolations. So I can try and fit this spectrum fit how it depends on, on my parameters and make an extrapolation. So it's a very convoluted thing, but it's what you have to do to try and extrapolate. Turns out that if this spectrum, the parameter Q here, which is related to the K dependence of the spectrum, is less than one, the spectrum is dominated by, by, um, by emission at high K. It then turns out that the axions from the, the final energy density in axions is subdominant to just the standard average realignment um, thing. So if you took the realignment that, that we did yesterday with some average value of theta, that would dominate over, the, over this emission, axions emitted from strings. But if the spectrum has a Q here greater than one, then it's dominated by small values of K. And then it turns out that the emission from strings dominates over the emission from, from misalignment. So you can fit the simulation results. So this is the instantaneous emission spectrum taken from simulations at different values of the log. 
So it's different values of scale separation. And then this is this the string density parameter, the, the, that parameter psi, also for different values of the log, for different simulations, these appear to go to some sort of attractor. So you can fit all of the simulations and try and extract the, the scale dependence of the string density parameter and the scale dependence of the spectrum. And when you do that, you can try and work out what the extra and relic density is finally. Um, that should say Q less than one there. No, that should say Q greater than one. Um, yeah, Q greater than one IR dominated. So finally, when you do that, you find that the, that the energy density in the axions depends on the spectral index in this way from the, from the string emission. It's very sharply dependent on Q around one. The realignment, the realignment um, population that you would expect for this particular value of F is here. So once, if Q is just a little bit larger than one, the emission from strings dominates, and then it's almost constant. So if we knew for sure that Q was larger than one and was growing as we increased our log scale separation, we would have a prediction for the axion mass because it's then independent of the extrapolation. So if Q is less than one, then the results depend very strongly on how you do the extrapolation. Now, a group um, in America, Bushman et al, um, have a theory prediction that Q is equal to one, and they've done one simulation that seems to um, that verify that Q is close to one at large log. And if you take Q equals one, you predict that the axion mass is about 65 micro EV, slightly larger, but not much larger than the range accessible to ADMX. However, another group who've done lots and lots of simulations and claim to control their statistics, claim that there is evidence for, sca for scaling violation of this Q and that it is increasing as you change the log. And if you extrapolate that to the physical log, you very quickly get to Q greater than one and saturate the production of axions from strings. And in that case, the axion mass would be about 500 micro EV. So the extrapolations at the moment are not in full agreement and they lead to about a factor of 10 difference in the, in the predicted axion mass. Not too much, it's narrowed down the axiom mass in this scenario to a relatively narrow range, but in both cases, you're much larger than the mass that's accessible to ADMX. And it turns out that it experimentally going from this mass to this mass would be very, very difficult. So it is predictive, um, but there's not consensus on what the mass is just yet. Right, now in the last, so I started about 10 minutes late, so I'm gonna, Finish about 10 minutes late. Yeah. So, 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 the, so the crucial thing, yeah, there's been a lot going on here. The crucial thing is what is the spectrum of axions, which is what's the spectrum of waves in the Goldstone boson that are being emitted by the strings, which are field configurations of the complex field. And that spectrum, if you can measure it, you can work out what the relic density is from that spectrum right, via, the, via the formula that I wrote down. And the fit to that spectrum has a, has a power law. And if that power law is infrared dominated, dominated by small um, wavelengths, it doesn't matter how infrared dominated it is, it, makes, uh, it, it sort of saturates to some fixed amount of, um, of um, dark matter. But if it's UV dominated, it, you don't get very many axions out of it, and the naive realignment result with some average value of theta gives a good prediction for what the axion mass is. And it's really the difference between the naive realignment and the IR dominated string spectrum result that leads to this difference in predictions for the axion mass. But it is in principle predictive, but it's the, but the challenge is in, is in the scaling, um, measure, measuring the spectrum and measuring its scaling vi violation. Now, yeah, I, I started about 10 minutes late, so I'm going to finish about 10 minutes late. And I hope that in um, 20 minutes, I can tell you all about some interesting indirect detection consequences of this scenario. I, I did, I said these high masses are not acceptable to ADMX. 
as yeah so this mass is not accessible to ADMX you would need a, a cavity that's too small this um, but there are ideas this mass there aren't even very many ideas to get this high um, and I'll comment on those right at the end okay so now I want to spend about 20 minutes talking about um, an astrophysical consequence of this scenario so we've got this string network decay and it in principle predicts the axial mass and we might be able to detect it on earth but can, but does it predict anything for astrophysics anything for indirect detection and it does it predicts so the string the string solution right the whole point is that we've got large variations of theta from place to place that means i've got big density perturbations in the dark matter field and that should make some prediction for indirect detection and it does and it goes under the name of axial mini clusters and i'm going to try and explain in in 20 minutes everything i know about about mini cluster formation um, what i'm going to tell you here is based on a few papers that i did with my former phd student david ellis um, lots of other people have worked on mini clusters but of course i think um, that our understanding um, is is the most useful one and um, so that's what i'm going to explain to you but this idea was first come up with first noticed in in the late 80s and um, by uh, Hogan and Reese, Reese, the Astronomer Royal um, in the UK, um, and it was and all the seminal work on this was done in the in the mid 1990s by Igor Tkachev and Rocky Kolb, and then it was sort of picked up again recently in sort of like the last six years or so um, by me and, and quite a few other people. Right. So what does that? What does it look like? This. Um, structure formation scenario I first want to show you results from a simulation so if you take the field configuration at the end of string decay and put it into an end body solver and work out what structure formation you get you get a whole bunch of small dark matter halos because of the large density perturbations structure formation gets going before matter radiation equality so even at matter radiation equality ledger 3300 there are already dark matter halos you can continue to solve the, but, it, but they form on very small scales, 0.2 parsecs. You can continue to solve um, the structure formation down to slightly lower redshifts in this case, but you can only get down to a redshift of about a thousand before you run out of resolution in your n-body simulation. So you can work out what masses um, and distribution of these new sort of dense dark matter halos there are, their size, you know, 10 milliparsecs. They were formed before matter radiation equality, so their average density is much higher than a typical dark matter halo that forms, you know, around redshift 20. So they're dense, they're small, they're of low mass, but you cannot simulate their evolution past redshift of about a thousand. So you don't know what the distribution of them is today. You can't go all the way from a box of 0.2 parsecs to the Milky Way, you know, with collapsed patch of order of mega parsec. Brute force will not tell you. What the distribution of these objects is at late times. Yeah. Density. The color scheme will be density. So red, red would be high density. Yeah, no baryonic matter. Um, because redshift a thousand, the baryons are still coupled to the photons. You don't so the great thing is you can just solve this in a homogeneous radiation background. You don't need to worry about anything else. These things are very low mass, they're not good, they're well below the baryon gene scale. You don't have to worry about baryonic physics. Um, it could be. Um, it's something I was chatting to a few people about. If these things have axion stars inside them and the axion stars explode, then they could um, have an imprint on the CMB. Um, I'm going to talk about late time observables, um, but there could, there, there could be um, high redshift observables. If there are, then, it, then, they're, they, then they're cleaner because we can do the simulation all the way up to high redshift. So we know what the distribution is. I, I haven't been able to think about any, but there very well could be. I think it's a, an open problem if someone wants to work on it. And um, what I'm going to try and do is take basically, you know, what we know about these objects at redshift 1000 and try and work out what they might, what their um, signals might be in the local universe um, today. But that's necessarily going to involve modeling because the simulations aren't going to take you all the way to the Milky Way. Right. So there are enhanced density perturbations and it leads to early structure formation. 
this is what the density perturbations look like. This is a slice through, through um, a simulation of the string, um, string network decay um, by Javi Redondo and friends. Um, they used some trick to get it um, to the end that I'm not going to bother talking about. And there are some density peaks here. And you can estimate the mass in these density peaks, which is roughly going to be the mass scale of these objects. They're, they're going to undergo hierarchical structure formation. There's not going to be one mass scale, but a rough mass scale, very, very rough mass scale to have in mind. It's going to be the density contained within the horizon at the time when the axion field begins to oscillate, when it starts behaving like matter. Here I'm calling that T1, I called it Tos earlier. You work, we can work out what that Tos is, so we can work out this approximate mass scale. And it's about 10 to the minus 13 solar masses for some reference value of the mass in this scenario. So very low mass, this sort of asteroid mass itch. Um, we've heard quite a lot about primordial black holes this, this conference already. Um, this is in the mass gap of primordial black holes. So it, it's a mass that, that we don't have really many, many probes of. Um, and I'm going to try and talk about what about some probes of this mass scale. But these things are much less dense than a primordial black hole. Right? They're not a point mass, they're an extended dark matter. Their typical density, um, rho divided by the energy density at equality, is much larger than the typical 200 of dark matter halos. Um, that we heard about in Sushmita's talk. Um, it's 140 delta cubed one plus delta, where delta is the, is the initial value of the overdensity. So these objects have a spectrum of different densities. They have a spectrum of different masses, and they come in a different range of overdensities that's classified by the statistics of this field. But this is not particularly well defined. And what I'm going to try and talk about in the next few minutes is efforts to understand what the mass spectrum of these objects is and what their typical densities are and density profiles. And this is not a complete story. There are a lot of loose ends in it and I'm not happy with it. Even though I've written two, paper, uh, two papers on it very recently, I am not happy with this story. And I think there's still a lot to do. Um, this is at redshift 10 to the five. after the string network has decayed. There's a realization of the field after the string network has decayed. Um, I can tell you details about the simulations um, offline. Yeah, yeah. This um, I'm gonna use from here on out as initial conditions for simulations, which were done by other people. And um, the work that um, myself and David did is we used semi-analytic models to try and understand structure formation um, based on, the, on this um, initial density field and the simulation results that we analyzed. Right, but these objects are so small that they're not going to form stars. So you form these objects before um, matter radiation equality, but then you still, but then they still have to. I'll show you the power spectrum in a minute. You still have to wait until redshift twenty for them to undergo mergers and form higher higher mass halos that can um, host gas and and lead to reionization. So they're such low mass that that um, you still they they they're not a problem for that. Um, yeah, so they are you know, 10 milliparsecs in size and roughly asteroid mass. And so then you have to go from redshift 1000 and do um, structure formation merges in order to get all the halos that we know and love. And I'll show that in a second. Right, so how does gravitational collapse look in, um, in this scenario? So here's the power spectrum which we all know and love, the matter power spectrum. Normally, we see the matter power spectrum up here. In the insert, I'm showing you know, the, the full power spectrum. We see the matter power spectrum up here on scales of, you know, about one inverse megaparsec or so. The power spectrum that's generated from the string decay is this, is this bump here. If you just take the power spectrum of that, of that box that I just showed you, it's, it's a little bump of enhancement above the ordinary matter power spectrum. For the parameters used in that simulation, it's an enhancement at about 10 to the 8 inverse megaparsecs. Um, and it's a bump above the ordinary matter power spectrum by, you know, about four orders of magnitude. You've got an enhanced perturbation. And that's, you know, from the point of view of a cosmologist, now you just know what to do with this, right? You can do press check there. 
right? And you can do an end body simulation with this power spectrum. And that's what we did. Um, so here is the mass function, the halo mass function at times before mass irradiation equality. Um, and what happens is you have some structure formation and then you, know, you keep on forming more. But you're not just at that reference mass scale that I showed you before, 10 to the minus 13 solar masses. You form objects on a whole range of mass scales. Then at redshift less than mass irradiation equality, hierarchical structure formation takes over. When hierarchical structure formation takes over, the mass function falls and moves out even further to higher masses. That's the signal of hierarchical structure formation. The amplitude of the mass function falls and it moves out to larger scales. This mass, this period of structure formation, the mass function is just growing. That is characteristic of peak collapse. You're having collapse just around isolated dense peaks. So here we use some variation of press sector that works on the real space density field um, called peak patch. Yeah, so, so this simulation, the string simulations that give you the initial conditions don't include gravity, right? Um, that is easy, does not include gravity. The initial condition simulations doesn't include gravity. Then you take this as an initial condition and include gravity and you get this. And a model for including gravity for a cosmologist is to take the power spectrum and do press sector. So that's putting gravity into the, into the initial condition. Okay, um, I'm gonna skip over a bunch of stuff and just show you a couple more results. So these numerical simulations have hierarchical structure formation after mass radiation quality. So these mini clusters that we started out with end up in um, halos, um, halos with NFW-like profiles because they undergo a bunch of mergers. The very densest things will survive as a subhalo inside this bigger mini cluster halo. And eventually the mini cluster halos will merge into bigger dark matter halos and bigger dark matter halos and eventually probably forms, you know, and eventually will form the Milky Way. But we can't simulate it all that way. Um, also, I talked about axion stars a bunch of times during this um, meeting. Um, Benedict Egemeyer. So Benedict Egemeyer did a bunch of these simulations. He was a PhD student at Göttingen, where I was. Um, he did the embody simulations. He also did during his master's thesis. Um, some wave dark matter Schrodinger Poisson simulations that we met those equations last time of a mini cluster. He took a very small region in that density field, simulated it with Schrodinger Poisson, and showed that mini clusters host axion stars in their centers. Just like you know you would expect from fuzzy dark matter simulations on very different scales, mini clusters also host an axion star in their center, and they they obey the core halo mass relation that I've talked about um, before already. But I just want to sort of highlight, I think in the early days in the 90s when people were first thinking about mini clusters, people sort of used the term mini cluster in Soliton and Axion Star like almost interchangeably. And, and I think for a while there was confusion in the literature that mini clusters were Axion Stars. They're not. Mini clusters are not single Axion Stars, but they host Axion Stars in the center. Next, using the simulations or using the semi-analytic models, you can work out what fraction of dark matter is, is locked up in mini clusters. And so here's the fraction of dark matter lost up to the mini clusters as a function of redshift. And it saturates somewhere around 60%. So around 60% of the dark matter is locked up in these things. Um, what happened to them, um, forget this, uh, I'm not going to, I don't have time to go into this, but look at this lovely GIF um, that, my, that David Ellis, my student, made. So here we are at very high redshift, 10 to the 5, going down to close to equality and then below equality. And you see that the dynamics changes a lot. So at very early times, so we've tagged a few particles that we think are going to end up in a dark matter halo and, and that our tagging worked. And you see that at early times they remain together, but there's gravitational collapse of the dense peaks. And then only after mass irradiation equality does hierarchical structure formation begin. And this is something that you see in the formalism of press sector. You take a, 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 you take a, um, a power spectrum like the one that I had, or if you do this peak patch and you actually find peaks that are collapsing, you see that at early times, it's only gonna be dense peaks that, that collapse. And, and then at late times, hierarchical structure formation happens. And you can just see that really nicely here. So here's the dense peak, he collapses, and then he ends up as a bound subhalo inside that bigger guy. That's the, that's the physics that's going on. 
And this is a combination of semi-analytic and numerical results that you can understand it with. Um, so we can look at these mini clusters and we can measure their density profiles. They are fit well by NFW, but there's some evidence that they might be slightly steeper than NFW. We don't always resolve the scale radius. And we can measure their concentration mass relation. And here at Redshift 99, and we can measure their mass function. And because we understand the theory um, and we have a semi-analytic model, we can, we can re, um, in, for the n-body simulations, that's done at a fixed mass. For the, for the string simulations, it's done at a fixed mass. Because we have an analytic model, we can actually rescale those results to different masses. So I can show you at 50 micro EV and 1 milli EV um, axial mass, the difference in the, in the say, mass, um, mass function of many clusters. Um, we can also estimate the sizes of, of, of what an axion star might take inside a mini cluster. And so here, so here we're measuring the, the velocity dispersion in the mini cluster. And as a function of mass, here are all our mini clusters. Um, I can show you what size the axion star and what mass the axion star is expected to have if it's in equilibrium with its halo. And using all of these things, I can try and now think about what the mini clusters might do um, phenomenologically. I've only got five minutes, so I'm only going to say this very quickly. One thing that they might do is microlensing. And I say question mark because at the moment, what we know from the simulations, we cannot be sure whether they, whether they do microlensing, essentially due to this spread in um, possible axion star radii. So I'm going to have to skip over microlensing. Um, I'm going to tell you, well, what can I tell you? Right. So microlensing of very low mass objects, very, very low mass objects do not show up in a microlensing survey like the Subaru Hyper Supreme cam, which gives these limits on primordial black holes. There's a low mass cutoff. If your mass is too low, um, the microlensing amplification is swamped by wave-like effects, wave optics effects. So your mini clusters have to be relatively massive to overcome these wave optics effects. I need mini clusters more, more massive than about 10 to minus 11 solar masses. But I have a wide mass function of mini clusters. So I, know, but I, so I know that only the ones in the tails of that mass function at relatively high mass are going to contribute to microlensing. That's good. I can tell you how many pass that cut. I also know the density profiles. And I know that you have to be above some, like some threshold density in order to um, undergo microlensing as well. Furthermore, I know roughly how, how, um, how big the axial stars are going to be. And so that provides another cutoff to the microlensing. <clears throat> And so we can work out the fraction of, <clears throat> let me skip that. I can work out the fraction of mini clusters in my sample that might be able to lens, that satisfy all of those cuts, that they're dense enough, they're massive enough, and the axion stars in the center are small enough that they might be able to lens. And what we find is that in our random sample of, of mini clusters, about 10% of them, might be dense enough to lens if the axial mass is about one milli EV. But all I can say, but I do not know if that sample is representative of all of the mini clusters. And I, and I emphasize might be able to lens because I, don't, because I haven't actually got axion stars in my simulation. I'm extrapolating for how big they might be. Okay. That's the one third. Yeah. Whereas we predict um, a scatter based on virial velocities. So that and that might be related to the to the scatter observed in fuzzy dark matter simulations. I'm not sure. This is scatter is just based on virial velocity. Um, or rather on, on velocity dispersion, measured velocity dispersion in the simulations. So mini clusters might be able to lens, but I don't know. Lastly mini clusters might show up in radio astronomy. And this is um, also might show up in radio astronomy. So, um, why are, why are, um, how do you get radio astronomy out of axions? You need something like a halo scope, like, that's, like the ADMX halo scope in the sky. Neutron stars are halo scopes in the sky. So you have a resonance condition provided by the magnetized plasma around the neutron star. That's playing the same role as the microwave cavity of ADMX. 
the neutron storage has, also has a massive magnetic field. So you've got a big magnetic field and you've got a resonance condition. They're, they're haloscopes in the sky. You get convert. So if you have, first of all, just an ambient axion dark matter field around, no many clusters, you will just convert that dark matter field into radio photons um, in your neutron star. The conversion happens when um, at a certain point around the neutron star where the axion mass is equal to the plasma frequency, the axions move through, they hit that point, they convert. And you can work out the power. Um, so this is the sort of picture. Here's the neutron star magnetosphere. The axions go through. There's some emission of photons from a particular surface. And we try and observe it. Some people, um, Josh Foster and company, but also Richard Batty, um, have, have tried to look for this effect by looking by staring at neutron stars with radio telescopes. Um, Josh Foster and co used something called the Breakthrough Listen Survey with the Green Bank Telescope, which is here. It was a survey that was looking at the galactic center, trying to get signals from extraterrestrials, and they repurposed it to try and look for, radio, for, for the radio line that you would expect if axion dark matter is converting in neutron star magnetospheres. They didn't see any radio line consistent with axions, so they were able to set limits on the axion photon coupling as a function of mass. The limits are at relatively high mass, 15 to 35 micro EV, not high enough to test the mini cluster scenario though, but higher than most haloscopes. So the blue limits are coming from, not from ADMX, ADMX is way off down here, but from a few other haloscopes. And they're able to exclude some region of parameter space that beats the astrophysical limits. What about mini clusters in this scenario? If I've got a mini cluster and a mini cluster goes through my, through my neutron star, I'll get a big burst of radio waves. I'll get a radio transient. But, in, but we have to then work out what the collision rate is of mini clusters with neutron stars. So that's so this is something I've been working on with um, Bradley Kavanagh and other people. So here is the encounter rate of mini clusters with neutron stars in Andromeda M31 um, as a function of um, mini cluster mass. So the rate can be very high for low mass mini clusters, up to 10 to, 10 to the five per day. Um, and then we work up the, the duration of the events in terms of days and that goes up. Um, and so there's, you know, some range where you expect to have order one encounter that's lasting about one day. So you always expect to be having sort of order one encounters times time. Very good. So you have to work out what that encounter looks like. And this is something Sam Withy's work done. You collide a mini cluster with a neutron star. The radio waves that you get out end up sort of all spaghettified all over the surface of the neutron star and you don't get any, um, you know, sort of uniform emission. That's something you have to think about. Then what I've been working on with a group of people um, based around the University of Virginia and many others is we've taken the Greenback Telescope, we've got some time on it, we've observed Andromeda because we thought we could get a big field of view. So here's our, our beam. We can see quite a big portion of Andromeda all at once and just look at Andromeda. So, so we're seeing all the neutron stars in this region of Andromeda, and we're hoping that sometime while we're observing, a mini cluster will collide with a neutron star and give us a radio transient. So we've made those observations, and we've made those observations at X band, and we're going to try and make them in L band. Um, we've taken a spectrum of Andromeda, we've simulated some events, but I can't yet give you the limits on the axion photon coupling because we're working on the analysis of that. But it's another promising thing that axion mini clusters might do give you bright radio transients. The problem is finding the right population of neutron stars and observing them um, for long enough that you expect to see a signal. So I'm going to skip this part about mini clusters and direct detection and go to my summary. You can talk about that in, um, in the questions. So to summarize, the QCD axion solves the strong CP problem and gives you a dark matter. It's couple, all of its couplings to the standard model are fixed by the axion mass. It's a one parameter model. If spontaneous symmetry breaking happens, happens after inflation, then the relic density only depends on the axion mass as well. So it really is a one parameter model. If you want to get the right relic density, you should know the axion mass. The challenge is to try and predict the axion mass from the relic density. And the challenge arises because of the complication of simulating the string decay. The scenario, however, predicts the existence of these dense objects called axion mini clusters, which offer an opportunity for axion indirect detection. 
possibly from microlensing and possibly from the existence of radio transients. However, both of these are sort of, um, the radio transients are difficult at high frequency. They offer a challenge to axion direct detection, which I didn't have time to discuss, which is because if all the dark matter is locked up in these things called mini clusters, well, the dark matter density on Earth is, is much lower than we think because the, ch the chance of colliding with one of these things is probably pretty rare. And if we're at high axion mass, then ADMX can't search for the axion. We need new technology to go to higher mass. But there is big excitement to come in the world of axions. And this is my last slide. Planned experiments will cover most of the, of the parameter space in the next 10 to 20 years. And this is showing that. So I'll stop there. Thanks. Sorry there to skip through, through, through so much, um, but I'm happy to talk about any of it in questions. I kind of have two questions. So first is about the mini clusters GIF that you showed. That is composed entirely of dark matter, exion dark matter, right? So um, I'm curious about how stable those structures would be because uh, I mean, if you could say something on that. Yeah, so, so very good question that they're, they're low mass. Um, and so you might worry that in the, in the Milky Way, they get tidally stripped and they're just not around anymore. So that's something that, um, I didn't have time to discuss, but I have a slide on. Um, so um, this, this was studied by Bradley Kavanagh and his collaborators, which is where the figures are from, but also in these papers. Um, they worked out the survival rate of mini clusters in the Milky Way. So we can't simulate the Milky Way from start to finish. Um, but so what they do is they imagine taking a model for the Milky Way and dropping mini clusters into it, assuming they make up you know, the 60% of the dark matter. And then using the model for, you know, for the stellar distribution in the Milky Way, um, they were able to compute the survival probability of mini clusters as a function of galactocentric radius. And so at large galactocentric radius, oh, there aren't many stars, and the survival of the mini clusters goes to one. So you should expect most of the dark matter to be clumped up in them. But at the solar radius, particularly if the mini clusters have NFW profiles, which are relatively under dense compared to our law, then there's significant tidal stripping and about 50% of the dark matter would be, 50% um, of mini clusters would be tidally stripped in the Milky Way if they're NFW, but it depends on knowing the density profile. Okay, uh, so my second question is kind of a clarification. So could you again explain the U1 to R3 mapping in case of cosmic strings, like how you get the... the... Right, okay, um, yeah. So when... Symmetry breaking happens. I, my field picks a location on this um, circle in the complex plane. So, so, the, so the jargon for this is that the state of the field, the vacuum manifold, has the topology of U1. Then I have to take the field which has a location on vacuum manifold R1 and put that into real space R3. So I, take, so I take random realizations of a field that has this topology and I have to map it into a space that has this topology R3. And when that happens, you will always end up getting places where the field wraps and you have cosmic strings. So that's what I mean. You have to map the, the topology of the field space into the, into the topology of, you know, real space, X, Y, Z. Okay, so um, after symmetry breaking, it assumes a certain con uh, configuration. So why don't you say that it just the dimension of the string decreases and you kind of get a line because... Yes, yeah, so, so you do, so, so, you have, so you have a line um, yeah. Maybe I'll talk to you later. Yeah. And the string has a finite, the string has a finite thickness, um, but it's extended. But then when the strings interact, they can have like crossings and they can form loops and things like that. Okay. No, I'm saying after symmetry breaking, you said that the strings, they, uh, they are not there, right? 
the There's the strings of there after spontaneous symmetry breaking. The strings only go away when the axion field starts to oscillate. Yeah. So when the axion field starts to oscillate, everywhere in space just goes to theta equals zero, and then the strings go away. Okay. 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 Thanks. Yeah. <clears throat> Yep. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so the mini clusters um, will host axion stars. <coughs> and those axion stars, if they get if they get too massive, um, could become unstable. Um, so that is something that was looked at in the paper um, in, in, a, in a paper very recently by Patrick Fox and Neil Weiner and some other people. So they looked at taking mini clusters, but for Alps rather than for the QCD axion. And they looked at when, when, when will a mini cluster host an axion star that's unstable and will decay. So that is definitely something that can happen. And it was looked at by those authors. Um, I believe that they found it wasn't relevant. So normally you find that things happen for Alps where couplings are large, where mass and coupling are free parameters. There's somewhere where, where you can get interesting physics to happen. But normally for the QCD axion, you end up being too weakly coupled and um, their, their limits don't extend to the QCD axion. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, it was long ago. Done the wrong thing, but now I have to do. Okay, can we leave it like this? I can't remember how to switch it over. We had a lot of other problems before. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Right, but they're, they're here. They're still on the QCD line. Um, and they're not quite as high as the astrophysical limit. They're on the edge of the constraints from supernova 1987A. So the supernova 1987A limit. Um, so supernova 1987A um, sets that the axion mass should be less than about. 100 milliEV or like maybe 20, less than like 10, like tens to hundreds of, of milliEV. Whereas the, um, the string decay scenario tells us the axial mass is greater than about 65 microEV. Or if you believe the Gorgetho simulations, then it's greater than about 0.5 milliEV. So that's a factor of like, 40 or so from supernova 1987A, but it's still pretty far. Yeah, that's all the stuff we talked about yesterday. Yeah, no, so. So the 10 to the minus 33 is just like the like you don't do any physics at all. It's just your basic, basic guess. 10 to the minus 33 EV would not form galaxies. But that's just like the very, very lowest limit. That you could yeah. The, the, there are. Um, the only one I know by name. And I believe all other solutions aren't axion like a variations on this model. It's called the Nelson Barr model. But I can't tell you any more about it. You can Google Nelson Barr model strong CP. If the, if the up quark was massless, you would also strong CP, but the up quark isn't massless. 
Right, okay, so first question. Um, so both of the contributions to the strong CP problem from the strong force and the weak force um, are both are both eaten up by this by this guy because you shift the because you because you shift the contribution from the weak uh, from the electro weak force you do what's called the chiral rotation of the quarks and it and it shifts everything onto this term but you can have um, an axion that couples to you could call it axion weak that couples to weak weak dual absolutely you can have such a coupling um, and it needn't be the same you know, the QCD axion couples to might couple to weak weak dual it probably does um in the df in the dfsz model the axion couples to weak weak dual um but you could have other axions that couple to weak weak dual um the instantons from this sector actually correct the axion mass you can compute it um but your next question about which of these limits would change if there were more if there were more than one axion um is part of my research pro research program um it's it's something that i'm very actively um thinking about so um first of all the the dark matter limits the limits from direct detection admx if you had multiple fields and they all shared some of the relic density these limits would be rescaled by the relic density in the field at that mass that's pretty easy some of these other limits might change in more complicated ways so for example let's say uh, cast is a helioscope it tries to search for axions from the sun the axions are created inside the sun and then they come to Earth and you try and observe them with a magnet or an X-ray detector. If you had multiple axion like particles, then the emission of those axions inside the sun might be affected by, by their self-couplings, the way that they mix later on. Um, that, that could be changed if there were multiple fields. Um, these limits here from X-rays might also be changed if there are multiple fields, if they mass mix with each other. Uh, these limits here, um, of very heavy alps um, from x-rays they rely on the thermal production um, of the alps in the early universe via this coupling um, but if you had lots of axions and they were coupled to each other then all then all that thermal production could be different um, so i think that many of these limits might be a bit different um, with multiple with multiple axions um, and it's not something that i think um, anyone has really um, anyone has really worked on um, but it's something I intend to do in the next few years. Uh, great, great question. Thanks for asking. Um, yeah. Yeah, so once you get above, once you take a mass that's above all the masses that we talked about last time, above 10 to the minus 19 EV, then as far as we know, structure formation is exactly the same as in cold dark matter. So for all of the masses that are relevant for the QCD axion, 10 to the minus 11 to 10 to the minus 2 electron volts, the formation of galaxies, dwarf galaxies, the Milky Way clusters, all of that is the same as cold dark matter. The only difference you get in structure formation is if you have this scenario B symmetry breaking, you make these very small objects as well. But all the large scale structure is unaffected once you get to sufficiently large mass. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so Axion does decay to photons. Indeed, um, someone else mentioned that as well. Um, it goes via, so it goes, we just replace the pi on here with the axion and replace all of these things with a's and pi's all the pi's with a's so the axion couples to photons it can decay to two photons um it has this spontaneous decay rate um and someone mentioned right we have to make sure that the axion is stable on... yeah so you could have um enhanced decay due to due to the enhanced yep yeah, yep yeah. um yeah, so you could try and work out something like like the for wimps like a j factor um for mini clusters yeah you would have enhanced you, you would have enhanced um dark matter okay i haven't thought about that um it's not something i've seen i've seen written about for mini clusters whether because of the enhanced density there's 
enhanced signals from axion decay. Um, some of these limits come from axion decay. Um, the X-ray limit here comes from decays, um, but, the, the, but those sort of limits tend to run out around here. But actually, if you put your axions in dense mini clusters, then maybe there are some, some, some decay limits, yeah. Um, haven't, I haven't seen it written back. Very good point. So in the case of misalignment, um, you can start with a non-zero velocity, but it quickly gets damped away. Um, there's a couple of what, what I mean, so it's just because at early time, so for misalignment, that's the equation of motion. At early times, H is much larger than M. So if you start with some non-zero velocity, it will get damped. Another way of understanding that is to think, okay, what is the um, energy density like in the oscillations? The energy density in the oscillations is this. Um, and at early times before you're oscillating, energy density in oscillations goes like A to the power minus six. Energy density in field velocities goes like A to the power minus six. So it very quickly damps away. If you have any initial velocity, so you can start with initial velocity, um, but, it, but it typically goes away. There's an exception to that rule. Um, there's, a, there's, a, there's a model for axion production, that's a bit different than misalignment, called um, cogenesis um, by Raymond Co. <laughs> and, uh, and then if, if you give it a very large initial velocity, then you can keep spinning. Around the, around the potential and it can hop over and things, yeah. And that, and that can change the story. You have to give it a very large initial velocity and, that, and then you do change the story. Um, yeah, so up cogenesis um, and it's called, no, sorry, it's called kinetic misalignment. And then they use kinetic misalignment to do something called cogenesis. Kinetic misalignment, you can give it a very large density and change it, very large velocity. Um, so you can, um, so, well, so one way that people try and look for axions by converting photons into axions is in the constraints that are up here, Alps and Oscar, um, um, what's called light shining through a wall. Um, you can also do um, laser collisions. So a photon converting into an axion, you can have, have a photon, apply a magnetic field, turn it into an axion. The axion moves unimpeded, so it can go through your wall comes out the other side, hit it with a magnetic field, observe a photon. So that's one of the cases where that happens. Um, and yeah, the other case where that happens is it like, if I scatter, if I do lasers, if I do, do light by light scattering, then the presence of an axion can change the results of light by light scattering, particularly the polarization. Um, in absorption, I'm not sure. Um, I'm not sure. Oh, but you also get, um, sorry, Photon to axion conversion. The other limit here, um, Chandra X rays. Um, so you have, uh, right, so you have um, you have a probability in the presence of a magnetic field in a cluster. You can work out the probability for a photon to turn into an axion moving through, you know, some region of magnetic field of size L. Um, and so that means that if you have Initially, some X ray spectrum that looks like this. This probability, if you account for this probability, the X ray spectrum would look like this. And so, and so, you know, the fact that, that Chandra observes a very lovely power law spectrum of X ray emission from, you know, some particular galaxies, NGC, something, something, um, you can use the absence of oscillations to place a limit on the axion photon coupling. So yeah, that, that's, um, I suppose that's absorption, um, changing of X-ray spectra. And it leads to actually the strongest constraints 
on the exon photon couple and get masses below 10 to the minus 11 electron volts. Right. Um, so if the spontaneous symmetry is broken during inflation, then um, I have a Goldstone boson and a massless field that's around during inflation. And it picks up fluctuations, basically Hawking radiation from the horizon. Picks up a fluctuation that goes like the scale of inflation divided by two pi. This is called the Gibbons Hawking temperature. This is a fluctuation in the axion field, which is not a fluctuation in the infraton. So it's orthogonal to the infraton. So it's what's called isocurvature. And this, um, and this, this is a scale invariant isocurvature fluctuation, which we don't observe in the CMB. So that means that I don't observe it in the CMB. I have to make H inflation smaller than some value. For the QCD axion, if I assume all the dark matter is the QCD axion, then um, you find that H inflation has to be less than something like 10 to the 10 GeV. Now, don't quote me on that. Um, I can find the exact number for you. But for the QCD axion, if these fluctuations are present, bubble has to be less than about 10 to 10 GeV. That's in scenario A, because you only get this in scenario A. In scenario B, the symmetry isn't broken, so there's no Goldstone boson. So there's no fluctuations like this. So there's no such, so, so in scenario B, there's no constraint on Hubble during inflation. And the only isocurvature you get is this mini cluster fluctuation isocurvature, which is not scale invariant. So it doesn't show up in the CMB. This is scale invariant, shows up in the CMB. The mini cluster isocurvature is not scale invariant. Um, so in scenario B, there is no constraint. So in scenario B, H inflation can be as large as it's allowed to be, which is 10 to the 14 GeV. Right, because if H inflation is 10 to the 10 GeV, the tensor scalar ratio is less than about 10 to the minus nine. <laughs> so you've got no hope of observing it. So if the QCD axion is a dark matter and it's scenario A, if, if, if we observe tensor scalar ratio and the QCD axion is a dark matter, then it would have to be in scenario B or something weird is going on in the universe. So let's imagine that we detect the tensor scalar ratio 10 to the minus three. And ADMX detects the axion tomorrow. That would then be very, very strange because ADMX can only detect the axion in scenario A. ADMX only works for masses about 10 micro EV and below. Has to be scenario A. But if you detect, but then you've, then you've detected the tensor scalar ratio. So something's very, very wrong. So something weird would have to be going on in the early universe. There are ways that you can get around this um, in non-standard models. Um, so it's very interesting. If you detect the axion and you, then it tells you something about the early universe. I mean, what it tells you is like, subject to interpretation, but it, it, it has the opportunity to tell you something like very profound about very early times. And if you detect these mini clusters, then you learn something about the universe. You learn that like, you, you, you learned that the universe was radiation dominated up to the scale of symmetry breaking. If I, if I, if I go and detect a mini cluster in microlensing tomorrow, and you know, some experiment is operating at high frequency detects the axion, then you go, wow, the universe is radiation dominated at temperatures way, way, way above BBM. So it gives you a real opportunity to, to learn about the early universe because of this connection to symmetry breaking. Thanks very much.